starts uh, recording. Okay. Uh, we also ask all the attendees to mute themselves for the duration of the lecture. We encourage you all to ask questions during the lectures, but please do so in the chat. One of the organizers will communicate your questions to the instructor. You will also have the opportunity to ask questions verbally at the end of each lecture. Uh, with that being said, we're very excited to have Macarena Arenas speaking on a crash course on isoperimetry. So whenever you're ready, Macarena. Okay, um, so thank you all for coming. Uh, so I'm going to be speaking about isoperimetry and isoperimetric functions uh, in geometric group theory. The notion of an isoperimetric function is uh, it permeates all areas of mathematics, and it's not surprising that it also pops up in geometric group theory. Uh, so I would like to start with some history. Uh, so our story starts in the ancient city of Tyre, which is located uh, was located in what is now modern Lebanon, and there lived uh, Queen Lido. And, and back then she was not the queen, she was the sister of King Pygmalion. And King Pygmalion uh, murdered, murdered uh, Dido's husband. So Dido fled from Tyre and she went all the way to the coast of North Africa, to what is now uh, Tunisia, to modern Tunisia. And there she wanted to uh, settle. Um, so she went and she spoke to the king of the region and she, uh, she wanted to buy some land from him, but she did not have a lot of money. So uh, she wanted to make a demand that was reasonable. And she asked the king for as much land as she could encompass with an ox hide. And the king thought that was a very reasonable demand, so he agreed. So Dido took an ox hide, which I'm going to draw like a square, and she cut it into very thin strips. And then what she did is she attached the strips along her endpoints to form a longer strip, a very long strip. And then she had to decide how to position the strip on the land so as to encompass as much area as she could. And she took advantage of the fact that she was near the coast and she chose a particularly nice spot around the coast. And she used the natural boundary that she had at hand. And she positioned uh, her strip in a semicircle around that boundary. So between the natural boundary and her strip, uh, she encompassed a certain amount of area, uh, a certain land, and there she founded the city of Carthage, which came to be uh, one of the greatest cities of ancient civilization. Uh, okay, so what's the moral of the story? Obviously, the moral of the story is that the circle is the shape that encompasses the most area in the plane. So the problem Dido had at hand was a problem of optimization, of maximizing the area given a, a, a specific plane. And what we want to do is something very similar, uh, but also very different in a certain sense, because instead of maximizing the area, we want to minimize it because minimizing the area is going to correspond to maximizing the efficiency of certain algorithms. Okay, so with that, let's actually get to the maths. So the word problem uh, was posed by Max then in 1910, and it asked the following question. So given a, a finite gener generated group with a presentation where the generating set is finite, is there an algorithm that decides if a word written as a product of elements in the generating set is trivial in the group. Uh, so with of notation, we write W equals one in G uh, when this is the case. And uh, if such an algorithm exists, we say that uh, the word problem is solvable in G. And implicitly, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that this is independent of the presentation. So let me make that explicit. Uh, so the solvability of the word problem does not depend on the presentation. 
as long as we are starting with a presentation uh, where the generating set is finite. And now the natural question is whether all groups are finitely um, have solvable world problem or finitely generated groups have a solvable world problem. And the answer is no. And one can see this by a cardinality argument because there are uncountably many um, finitely generated groups. Uh, but the question is not so obvious if we restrict to the class of finitely presented groups. So if instead of considering finitely generated groups, I only look at finitely presented groups, uh, is it true that all finitely presented groups have a solvable world problem or not? And the answer is again, no. So there are finitely presented groups that do not have a solvable world problem. Uh, but the answer is not so straightforward. It took uh, many years for someone to come up uh, with a counterexample. And this is work of Naviko and Boone from the 50s. The good news, however, is that uh, most groups that we can think about that are finite represented do have a solvable world problem. And so if we know that we want to uh, somehow quantify how complicated an algorithm for solving the world problem is going to be. So that's what uh, this talk is about. Okay. So first I want to tell you a bit about how we understand the world problem uh, topologically. So given a, a group presentation, there is something called the presentation complex, uh, which has, it has one zero cell. It has one cells corresponding to the elements of the generating set. And it has two cells corresponding to the uh, elements of the set of radiators. So this is the typical picture. Each loop corresponds to uh, one generator in the group. And each of the two cells corresponds to one radiator. Uh, the boundary of each two cell is uh, um, reads the word in the variation, in the corresponding variation. So uh, the presentation complex is useful because it embodies, it's an embodiment of the, of the group uh, topologically. So the fundamental group of the presentation complex is again isomorphic to the original presentation. And this is by Ivan Kampen's theorem. Um, the universal cover of the presentation complex is called the Cayley complex, the Cayley two complex for the group for the presentation. And the one skeleton of the presentation of the KE complex is the KE graph with respect to that presentation. Macarena, we have a quick question. So is there an easy example of a finitely generated group that has a solvable word problem with the one finite generating set, but has an infinite generating set where the word problem is not solvable? Um, That's hairy. I mean, I think you are, you're only interesting, interested in asking uh, about the solvability of the world problem if the, um, if the generating set is finite to begin with. I'm not, sure if, I'm not sure how much the question makes sense if you start with a presentation where the generating set is not finite. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Okay, so let me give you some examples. So the free group in two generators is given by the presentation, uh, this presentation, and it has a presentation complex with it, which is just the bouquet of two circles. Um, the group set square with the usual presentation. So two reators, uh, two generators and one reaction. Uh, has a presentation complex, which is uh, we start with the bouquet of two circles. And then we go in a two cell. And because the relation has length four here, the two cell is going to be a square. Uh, the boundary of the square is going to be a word. And the space that we obtain uh, by doing uh, by going this two cell to this bouquet of circles is just the torus. Another example is the fundamental group of a surface, say a surface of genus two. Uh, it's a standard presentation has four, four generators. 
and one reactor, which is a product of two commutators. And the presentation complex, uh, again, we start with a bouquet of circles, in this case, four circles. And we go in a cell which has as its boundary uh, this reaction. So it's going to be an octagon. And when we when we glue these two cells to this um, bouquet of circles, what we get is again the surface of genus. Okay, so those are some examples. And now we want to study uh, the triviality of our world in this complex. So if a word is, um, if, if we have a word in the, written in the presentation in the generating set, then it corresponds to a closed path in the, in the complex. And if the word is trivial, then the path is not homotopic. And we have Van Kampen's lemma, which tells us that if the word is trivial, then uh, the path bounds to this diagram and vice versa. So all paths that we're going to be considered are combinatorial paths. So in fact, they map to the one skeleton of the complex. And um, the point of this uh, lemma, what it's telling us is that, uh, so we start with, um, we start with a, with a word and that word represents a path, a close path. And if the, if the, if the path is trivial, if the, the path is trivial, then it's not homotopic, it's homotopic to a point. And that is witness that is uh, certified by a disk. But that disk might not be combinatorial. And uh, what Van Kampen's lemma is telling us is that it's combinatorial and it's very nice. So let me say explicitly what uh, this diagram is. So uh, this diagram is uh, a contractible planar to complex. And this diagram in, in, a, in a space is just a combinatorial map. from the disk into the space. Okay, so those are these diagrams. And now let me tell you a bit about how we quantify the word problem. Uh, so if a word represents the trivial element in the group, then it can be expressed as a product of conjugates of radiation center inverses. And uh, there are probably many expressions of this kind, but we can take one that has the minimal number of factors. And the area of the, the world is going to be the minimal n, such that an expression of this form exists. And uh, we have an equivalent definition in uh, geometric terms. And so if a path uh, is not homotopic, then the area of the path is just going to be the minimal area of a diagram mapping to the complex and having that path as its boundary. Okay, so now we're in a position to define uh, um, isoparametric functions. So if we have a finite presentation for a group, a map is an isoparametric function for that presentation. If the area of a word is bounded by uh, the function evaluated in the length of the word, and we want this to hold for every word that represents the trivial element in the, in the group. Equivalently, so in geometric terms, uh, we want the area of a path to be bounded by the function evaluated in the length of the path for all uh, non-homotopic paths mapping to the KE complex. So uh, instead of looking at the paths in the, in the presentation complex, we want to look at them in the universal color. It's equivalent, but it's just uh, much easier to, to deal with disks, to, to understand the disks in the universal color than in the, in the portion. So we're going to be asking the paths to be uh, in the universal color, in the KE complex. Um, I'm not sure if I said this before, but the length of the path is just the number of edges because it's a combinatorial path. Um, it's just uh, the, the number of edges. Um, and a couple of, uh, so this is just an isoparametric function. 
and we're going to be interested in minimal isoparametric functions. So a then function is going to be an optimal, optimal isoparametric function. And uh, the definition is just that. And uh, something that I want to highlight here and that is important is that this definition only makes sense for finite presentations. If we start with a presentation that is not finite, then uh, this doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to define the isoparametric function. And the reason for this is that if you start with a given presentation per group, if you start with a presentation and you define a new set of relators, which is going to be the set of words Um, that represent the identity. You can define a new, a new presentation for the group, which has the same generating set and this new set of relators. And in this new presentation, every word has aria one. So it's not very interesting. You cannot do anything uh, very interesting with this definition in, in the case of an infinite presentation. Uh, so, so we're going to limit ourselves in, in this talk, in the remaining, uh, what remains of this talk and in the, the other two talks, we're just going to limit ourselves to finite presentations. Okay, and uh, we have a theorem that creates uh, the solvability of the world problem with uh, the nature of the, of the then function. So a group has a solvable world problem if and only if it has a recursive isoparametric function. So I want to define carefully what recursive means because it would involve getting uh, in things like um, Turing machines, but you can think of it as meaning um, effectively computing. And I'm going to give a sketch of the proof of this theorem. And uh, this sketch of the proof should give you an idea of what I mean by effectively computable and by what I mean by recursive. OK, uh, so let's go through the proof. Uh, we're go first going to show that if, if, the, then if the isoparametric function is recursive, then the word problem is solvable. So whenever uh, a word represents a trivial element in the group, we can compute an expression of the word as a product of conjugates of creators and their inverses. And we can compute such an expression so that it's optimal, so that it's minimal. And not only that, but we can also compute the length of the conjugator in each of these expressions. And uh, we can do this just in terms of information we already have in terms of n and the presentation. And uh, this implies that for the set of words of length less or equal to, to n, representing the identity, uh, this set can be effectively listed. The, the elements of this set can be effectively listed because it's a finite set and, uh, and we have the length on, on, the, on the length of words. So uh, this implies that we can effectively check if a word is in this list just by brute forcing it. We can check if, if a word is in this list. And this implies that the, this gives an algorithm to solve the word problem. In the group. Now for the Sorry, other direction. Uh, Macarena, can I ask? Yeah? I, I, what was G? I didn't understand what. Oh, G is um, one of these relators, one of these uh, conjugates. Ah, OK. OK. In this expression. Thanks. So uh, to be able to uh, effectively use the words of length uh, yes or equal to n that represents one, we have to have a, a length on, on the, a bound on the length of these words. And that comes from knowing this expression and knowing the length of the conjugators. Okay, okay. and now uh, we're going to assume that the group has a solvable word problem and show that it has a recursive isoparametric function. Okay, so if the word problem is solvable, then we can decide if a given word represents the identity in the group. So we can take the set, we can take the tuple, the ordered tuple of all words of length less or equal to n that represent the identity in the group. And having this set, we can compute the expressions 
we can compute expressions for each of these words in terms of a product of conjugates of reactors and their inverses. Um, and this gives a bound on the area, uh, on the maximal area of each of these words. So having one of these expressions gives us a bound on the area of that word. Uh, so this gives us uh, an estimate of the isoparametric function for words of length uh, at most n. So this shows that the function is recursive. Okay. Um, and just a remark, uh, I, I did this proof for the isoparametric function, but it also holds for the tenth function. So if the if an isoparametric function, so if an isoparametric function for a group is recursive, then in particular the tenth function is recursive just because it's a minimal isoparametric function. Okay, uh, so we have, we have uh, one big problem with isoparametric functions, with the current definition we have of isoparametric functions. And the problem is this, we would like to be able to prove a theorem or uh, that says something along the lines of, um, of what we said for the word problem. So we want the, 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 the then function not to depend on the on the group to be an invariant not to depend on the presentation to be an invariant of the group and that's not the case with the definition we have right now uh, and the way to remedy uh, this uh, problem is by uh, taking an equivalence uh, relation so here's the definition uh, you can look at the definition if you want but what i want you actually to be thinking about is that we do not care about whether a function is say uh, f of n equals n or f of n equals 3n plus 5. These two functions are linear and that's what we care about. We just care about whether the function is linear or quadratic or exponential or logarithmic. And um, so taking um, this equivalence, so just caring about the growth type of the function solves our problems. Uh, so now we can actually state a theorem, which is that if uh, we have two presentations of the same group, uh, two finite presentations of the same group, then the then function of the presentations, and the then functions of the presentations are equivalent. So in particular, it's well defined up to constants to write then g uh, for the then function of the group. Okay, and there's another course notion that we're going to care about, which is a quasi-isometry. Uh, so a map is a quasi-isometry if it satisfies two conditions. The first one is that it uh, only distorts distances uh, by an additive and a multiplicative constant. If this condition is satisfied, we say that the group, um, that, that the function is a quasi-isometric embedding. And the second condition, is that we want the function to be coarsely surjective. And if these two conditions hold, we say that the map is a uh, quasi isometry. Uh, two metric spaces are going to be quasi isometric if there is a quasi isometry between them. And we want a notion for groups, we want a definition for groups. So we say that two groups are quasi isometric if uh, their K graphs are quasi isometric. And now we have another theorem. So actually, if two groups are quasi-isometric, then their then functions are equivalent. And this theorem has some nice consequences. Uh, so it implies that the solvability of the word problem is a quasi-isometry invariant for finitely presented groups. Uh, so 
it's not only that the the method of proof that we have here not doesn't work for general uh, finitely united groups, but it, this is false in general for finitely united groups. There are examples of finitely generated groups that have a solvable word problem and are quasi isometric to, to groups that do not have a solvable word problem. They are just class of groups for which uh, solvability of the word problem is a QI invariant, these finitely presented groups. Okay. Um, so I would like to tell you about the way that uh, Max then approached the word problem um, when he first introduced it. And it was through something called dense algorithm and dense presentation. Um, so we have, um, so a presentation is a dense presentation. If first of all, it's a finite presentation. And for every word that represents the identity in the group, there is a relation uh, such that at least, uh, such that more than half of R is a subword of W. Um, and how does this help solve the word problem? Well, if we start with a word that represents the identity, uh, then there is a reator, which we can write uh, as, as the concatenation of two subwords, uh, say S and T. And the length of S is strictly more than the length of T. Now I can write W in the following form. I can write W as the concatenation of three subwords, U, uh, S and V. And I can switch, so I can, I can, uh, I can rewrite the word as a new word, uh, W prime, which is the concatenation of U, uh, T and V. And because of our hypothesis here, uh, W prime is strictly shorter than W. So if we apply this process a finite number of times, we get to the empty word, we get to the trivial word. Uh, so this is an algorithm for solving the word problem in the group. So how do we uh, think of this uh, graphically? So if we have a word here, I'm right, I'm, right, I'm just drawing a, a piece of the word. So this is our word W, and there's a reator. So this is our reator. And um, the path, the, the, the word that represents a reator is divided into two subwords, one of which is S and the other one is T. And what I can do is that I can push out these two cells this reator. And instead of going through the path outside, I can go to the path inside. And this is going to be W prime. And uh, because S is longer than T, W prime is shorter than W. And not only, only that, you can see in this sort of graphical picture that every time we do one of these reductions, we're also reducing the area of, of the diagram bounded by the word by one. So this implies in particular, um, this implies in particular uh, that if we have a dense presentation, then the, ISO, the dense function of the presentation is linear. Because at each step, we're reducing the length of the word by at least one, and also the area by at least one. So then use this algorithm to solve the word problem for a surface groups. And what he did is that he realized that the um, standard presentation, that the usual presentation of a surface group, so the presentation of the form um, A1 up to AN, B1 up to BN, with one reactor which is the product of all of the commutators. So this presentation is associated to a presentation complex, which has a four N gone as its two cell. And in the universal cover, this looks like the hyperbolic plane dialed by uh, four N gons. So the drawing I have here is uh, the hyperbolic plane 
styled uh, by octagons. And it corresponds to the KU2 complex of the fundamental group of the surface of genus 2. Uh, so you can see in this picture that if I take uh, a loop, if I take uh, a loop that represents a world that is trivial in the group, then I can do the procedure that I described before. There are cells in the boundary uh, that share a own part of the boundary with the world. So instead of going through the path outside, which is very long, I can go through the path in the inside to get a disk that has this area and uh, that is the boundary is shorter. And I can keep doing this until I get to the trivial world. And this is uh, the algorithm that then described to solve the world problem in um, surface groups or surface groups. Okay, uh, so now let me tell you about hyperbolic groups. So a triangle is delta t if each of its sides lies in the union of the delta neighborhoods uh, of the other two sides. And we say that a group is hyperbolic or delta hyperbolic if we want to be specific about the constant. If there is a delta and a finite generating set such that all the geodesic triangles in the KE graph of the group uh, with respect to that generating set are delta thing. And again, I'm giving you a definition that depends on the presentation. Um, and I want to say that this doesn't matter. So if the KE graph of a group with respect to a finite generating set is delta thin, is delta hyperbolic, and um, S prime is some other finite generating set. For G, then there exists a constant T prime such that the K, the K graph of G with respect to this new uh, generating set is delta prime thing, is delta prime hyperbolic. So the constant depends on the generating set but the existence of a constant that makes uh, the group hyperbolic, the presentation hyperbolic, uh, does not depend on the, on the generating set. It's an invariant of the group. And in fact, um, being hyperbolic is also a quasi-asymmetry invariant. Okay, so what, what's the picture to keep in mind? Well, if we have a triangle in a tree, then uh, whenever we have a side of the triangle, the other two sides uh, have to overlap with the first one because there's there's no other way they can go. So uh, the triangle is uh, zero hyperbolic. So for delta equals to zero, the triangle is hyperbolic. Um, if we're, this is like a more um, standard situation. So this is like the typical picture. So whenever we have a side of the triangle, we want there to be uh, neighborhoods of the other two sides, such that these neighborhoods together cover the third side of the triangle. And we want uh, the thickness of the neighborhoods, so the delta, to be uniform. So the delta in this definition is very important. It doesn't depend on the triangle. It has to be the same delta for all triangles in space. So what's an example of something that is not hyperbolic? Uh, well, if we have a triangle in the Euclidean plane, uh, then uh, we can choose a side. And, and we can always choose a delta to make uh, this side lie in the union of the delta neighborhoods of the other two sides. We can always do that uh, for any fixed triangle. But then, because we have homotities in the Euclidean plane, I can make this triangle bigger while preserving the proportions. And I can make it bigger and bigger until the delta that I, that I originally chose no longer works for this triangle. And then you can tell me that maybe I chose the wrong delta to begin with, and you can choose a different delta. And uh, you can do that, but then I can make the triangle bigger again until the new delta that you chose no longer works for this triangle, and so on. 
So there's no uh, uniform delta that makes all triangles a delta thing. So this is a non-example. This is not hyperbolic. OK, uh, so what are some examples? Well, finite groups are hyperbolic. You can take the diameter uh, of the K graph to be your delta. Finitely generated free groups are hyperbolic for delta equals to zero. Um, just this is because of what I explained before about trees. The K graphs or free groups are trees. So uh, triangles um, are zero thin. Uh, surface groups are hyperbolic. So the fundamental groups of closed surfaces of uh, negative all your characteristic. Uh, the fundamental groups of um, closed uh, negatively curved Riemannian manifolds are hyperbolic. Uh, some small cancellation groups are hyperbolic. If you don't know what small cancellation means, it doesn't matter. And you can just take it to mean that some quotients of hyperbolic groups are hyperbolic. Uh, if you do know what it means, uh, in particular, in uh, in particular, um, C prime one six and C seven small cancellation groups are hyperbolic. Um, some graphs of hyperbolic groups are hyperbolic. Again, if you don't know what that means, it doesn't matter. Uh, it just means that sometimes when you start with a hyperbolic group and you take H and N extensions or free amalgamated products, you still get a free group. Sorry, a hyperbolic group. Um, random groups are hyperbolic. This just means that in a precise probabilistic sense, almost all groups are hyperbolic. So what are some non-examples? Uh, Non-finitely generated groups are not hyperbolic, just because uh, in the definition we require there to be a finite generating set for the group. Uh, set to the n for n uh, larger or equal than 2 is not hyperbolic. And in fact, something stronger is true. So no group containing. Set to the n can be hyperbolic. Uh, so set to the end is like a Poisson group for hyperbolicity. And the same is true for bomb sex solitaire groups. So bomb sex solitaire groups are given by these presentations. They have two generators and one relation, um, which is a conjugate of this form. And these groups cannot be hyperbolic, and uh, they also cannot be contained in hyperbolic groups. OK, uh, so we have examples and non-examples. Let's move to some theorems. So uh, we have a characterization of hyperbolicity in terms of the growth type of the Dan functions. OK, so a group is hyperbolic if and only if uh, the Dan function for the group is linear. So this is a characterization uh, of hyperbolicity. This is equivalent to being hyperbolic. And uh, these foils are at least one direction of these foils from another theorem, which is that a group is hyperbolic if and only if it has a then presentation. So we explained above when, when we have that when we have a then presentation, um, we have a linear bound on the then function. So that's how these two theorems connect. And in fact, we can give an, ex an explicit then presentation for a hyperbolic group. So if a group G is delta hyperbolic uh, for some generating set S, then we're going to define R to be the set of words uh, of length less or equal than eight delta. So these are the words that represent the identity and that have a length 
at most eight delta. And then the presentation uh, with the same generating set and with reactions this set, this set of reactions is a then presentation. Uh, for the group. So a corollary of this uh, of this theorem is that uh, hyperbole groups are finitely presented. So they are finitely generated by definition, but they are also finitely presented. Uh, this was not obvious from the definition. There are many ways to prove this, but this is probably the one that utilizes the least amount of machinery. OK, uh, so now let's move to a different kind of group, so different kind of functions. Uh, so let's uh, figure out what, what are the then functions of, what's the then function of set square. And uh, I claim that, it's, uh, that it is quadratic. So to prove this, uh, we have to prove the lower bound and the upper bound. And for the lower bound, we have to show that uh, there exist diagrams that require uh, a quadratic amount of area. And for the upper bound, uh, there are many ways of doing this. Uh, so we're going to start with the lower bound. So here I have the KE uh, graph, the KE2 complex for z square with the usual presentation. And we're going to be looking at words of the form a to the k, b to the k, a to the minus k, b to the minus k. So these words are trivial in the group, represent the trivial element in the group. And in the in the k into complex, these look x squares. These diagrams look x squares. So there's k, b to the k, a to the minus k, and b to the minus k. And the length of the boundary of these diagrams, so this is w, k, the length of w, k is four times k. And the area of the diagrams that we have here is, uh, k squared, which is equal to the length of the word squared divided by 16. And uh, so this gives us a, a quadratic relationship between the length of the boundary and the area of the diagrams. But it's not, it's perhaps not obvious at this point that these diagrams are optimal. Um, and this is going to follow, there's, there's many, way to, many, many ways to prove this. Uh, one way is using Gerston's lemma, which we're going to talk about tomorrow. Uh, but in fact, these diagrams are optimal. So the area of these diagrams is equal to the area of these words. So this gives uh, a lower bound for the uh, isoparametric function, for the then function. We, are, we have exhibited these diagrams that require a quadratic amount of area to be filled. Um, that probably stupid, but why is the area of dk squared not like uh, 16k squared? Or what, what should it be like? Uh, the yeah. area is k squared, which is um, the length of the word squared divided by 16, right? That's, uh, you see why? Wait, don't you just define the area to be? It's number? a number of two cells. So it's k cells. times k. Oh, right? oh, oh, k oh, squared. oh, yeah, yeah, I see, I see. Okay, yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah. Okay. Um, so for the upper bound, uh, given a word that represents the trivial element in the group. Uh, what we want to do is push uh, all the A's in the word to the beginning of the word. To the, I don't know how to spell, spell beginning. Um, to the beginning of the word. Um, and this is going to take, this takes at most um, n applications, uh, n square applications of reactors. Or actually of the reactor, because there's only one. Um, 
So this 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 is why this is what's going to give us the upper bound because once we have pushed all the a's to the beginning of the world, or all the a's and all the a inverses, uh, that means that in the end of the world, in the second part of the world, all we have is this. And the number of a's and the number of a inverses has to match because the world represents a trivial element in the group. And the number of b's and the number of b inverses have to match because the world represents a trivial element in the group. So we can cancel out the a's with the a inverses and the b's with the b inverses. Okay. So there's uh, there are many more general classes of groups for which uh, the then function is quadratic. One such class is uh, cat zero groups. So what's the cat k condition? The cat k condition um, compares triangles in a metric space in a geodesic metric space X with triangles in a model space. And the model space in the cases that we care about uh, is going to be either the Euclidean plane or the hyperbolic plane. So what we do is that uh, for any triangle, for any geodesic triangle in, in our space, there is a corresponding triangle in the, in the model space, which we call this triangle a comparison triangle. The side lengths uh, are the same for the comparison triangle than for the original triangle. And uh, we want that for any pair of points in our triangle, the corresponding pair of points in the comparison triangle uh, are at distance uh, more or equal. Uh, so we want that the distance between three P and Q is less or equal than the distance between P bar and Q bar. And we want this to be the case for uh, all pairs of points in all, in all triangles if, in our space. And if this is satisfied, then the space is cat zero or cat minus one, depending on whether the triangles, uh, the comparison triangles lie in uh, the Euclidean plane or in the hyperbolic plane. Okay, um, so two remarks. The first one is that uh, cat minus one implies cat zero, just because if a triangle is at most as fat as a triangle in Euclidean space, in a hyperbolic space, then in particular it's at most as fat as a triangle in Euclidean space. And the other one is that uh, cat minus one implies delta hyperbolic. Uh, the converse is not known to hold, and uh, it may it may be false, it may be true, it's not known to hold. It's not even known if delta hyperbolic in place can zero. Uh, okay, and um, this again is a definition for metric spaces. We want the definition for groups. So a group is cat zero or cat minus one if it acts geometrically on a cat zero or a quad, cat minus one space. So geometrically here just means uh, properly and co -complicate. So one remark is that uh, being cat zero, the property of being cat zero is not a QI invariant. Um, but anyway, um, we, we understand the then functions for uh, cat zero groups. So if a group is cat zero, then its then function is at most quadratic. Okay. And uh, so this is not a characterization in the in the case of hyperbolic groups, we had a characterization of hyperbolicity in terms of uh, the function, the, the then function being linear. But in the case, case of cat zero groups, this is not a characterization. And in fact, uh, the class of groups that have quadratic then function is much, much, uh, much more vast. So what kind of groups have quadratic isoparametric function? Uh, all of these. So semi-hyperbolic groups, these include automatic and cat zero groups. Um, I'm not going to say what, what this means. The point is just that uh, there are many classes of groups that uh, have quadratic then function. That's what I'm trying to communicate. So I won't give you the definitions of all of these things, uh, but I'll try to say a bit about each of them. So three bicyclic groups. So these are groups of the form 
FN, semi-direct product set. Uh, this is a theorem of uh, Brisson and groups. Uh, some nilpotent groups uh, have uh, quadratic band functions. So some nilpotent groups of whole classes have quadratic band functions. Some polycyclic non-nilpotent groups also have uh, quadratic band functions. SLN set for n larger equal than five. This is a theorem of Jung, of Robert Jung. And in fact, he conjectures, uh, or people conjecture that this is true for um, SLN4, SL4 set also. Uh, Thompson's group F also has a quadratic isoparametric function. This is a theorem of Kuba. And Stalling's group also has a quadratic band function. Uh, this is a theorem of Dyson, Elder, um, Riley, and Jung. And the point of this is that these are all very uh, different classes of groups. And they don't all fit like, in, in a uniform framework. Um, it is not very clear what they have in common other than the fact that they have a quadratic band function. So it's sort of very mysterious. It's still very mysterious. Um, sort of how having a quadratic then function is related to other properties of the group. Okay, uh, so I want to tell you a little bit about um, then functions that are polynomials of higher degree. And for that, I want to remind you first a bit about uh, neopotent groups. So recall that a group is neopotent if it has a lower central series of finite length. Margarita, uh, can you ask me what Stalin's group is? Uh, yeah, I don't want to write the definition. Uh, tomorrow, I am going to tell you what Stalin's group is. Great. Um, because I'm going to give a specific definition that is uh, that it requires a lot of grant, uh, a lot of sort of uh, a lot of things. So I'm not going to get into that right now. Okay. Um, so a group is nilpotent if it has a lower central series of finite length. Um, and the class of a nilpotent group is the least length of a lower central series. For the group. And a free nilpotent group is just a, is a equivalent, it's the analog in the category of nilpotent groups. of a free group. So a free nilpotent group of class C is uh, uh, explicitly defined in the following way. So it's a quotient of the free group in K generators by the C plus one term in the central series. And uh, so that's the free nilpotent group of class uh, C. Okay. So uh, it turns out that for nilpotent groups, um, their then functions, their isoparametric functions are bounded by polynomials of degree at most, the class plus one. Plus one. And when the nilpotent groups are free, this is in fact sharp. So it, uh, for a class C free nilpotent group, its then function is of type uh, polynomial of degree C plus one. But what is perhaps more surprising is the fact that not all nilpotent groups have then functions that are uh, integers. So there are, there are nilpotent groups with non-integer then functions. Uh, there are also other groups that have polynomial uh, then functions and that are not nilpotent, but this is uh, sort of one of the biggest classes of examples, one of the biggest sources of examples of um, then functions of that are polynomials of higher degree. Uh, so I think I'm going to finish with this today. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Macarena? <laughs>
Uh, uh, by the way, uh, questions can be verbal now. <laughs> um, I think we want to stop the uh, 